station. This is Houston. Are you ready for the event? Ready for the event. Houston ACR, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call station for a voice check. Station, this is Houston ACR. How do you hear me? Station, this is Houston ACR. How do you hear me? Station, this is Houston ACR. How do you hear me? Houston ACR, this is uh, Station. I have you loud and clear. How me? Loud and clear. Please stand by for opening remarks. Hello, I'm Roger Wilkinson, principal of Franklin County High School in Carnesville, Georgia. We here at Franklin County High School are excited to have this opportunity to ask questions of astronauts on the International Space Station today. Our theme for this downlink event is, how can we help? It's a question we hope our students continue to ask themselves as they move towards graduation and decide on their future careers. Now, here are the questions from our students. Hello, my name is Sanai and my question is, what did it feel like traveling to space? Were you nervous or excited? Hey, Sanaya, thank you for that question. Um, so physically, uh, it's an amazing experience. Uh, when the, engine, the engines on the rocket light up, you feel that uh, acceleration in your chest. You feel pushed back into your seat, and, uh, and you feel that acceleration um, until the engines cut out. And when the engines cut out and you've made it into low Earth orbit, uh, you can feel the release of that pressure, um, but you're still strapped in, So, but you you know, there are things like we have pens and those sorts of things on the lanyard and you see those float and it's, uh, it's pretty amazing. Uh, from an emotional perspective, uh, definitely felt a little nervous, but very, very excited. Uh, this was a culmination of years of hard work and, uh, and so very excited to now be up here on the space station. Hello, my name is Anala and my question today is, how do you stay in contact with people up in space? And all of that's a great question, and it's a really important part of these long-duration space flights, that ability to stay in touch with family and friends. Um, and so we have an, an amazing array of capabilities. We have a voice over internet protocol phone. So through my laptop, I'm able to call phone numbers back on the ground to talk with family and friends. Um, we have video conferences once a week. Uh, so I, I get to see, talk, see and talk with my family by video conference for about an hour and a half uh, once a week. Um, and uh, we can take pictures and video and send those to the ground. And we also have a ham radio station, so we can contact other ham radio operators, amateur radio operators on the ground with that. Hello, my name is Grayson, and I was wondering if the texture of food is different in space. Grayson, that's a great question. The texture of the food mostly depends on the food itself. We've got a couple of styles of food here. Um, one is uh, one type is sealed in these kind of metallic envelopes, and this is either irradiated or thermostabilized. But this is food that has been pre-cooked on the ground, and we simply warm it up. We put it into a food warmer. This is meatloaf, and uh, and once it's warmed up, it uh, tastes and the texture is very similar to to what we, you'd experience on Earth. The other type of food we have is dehydrated food, and we would attach this to our water dispenser, um, add water, either hot or cold, depending on the food itself, and so this is mac and cheese. And so this will, uh, the, only, the only reason that the texture might be off is if you don't let it rehydrate enough or if you don't add enough hot, hot water. Um, I had asparagus uh, the other night. I didn't put enough water into it, and I didn't wait long enough, and it was a little bit like eating hay. So uh, definitely want to follow the instructions. Hey, my name is Kayla, and I was wondering if there's an official language on the International Space Station. Kayla, it's a great question. 
Um, so on the U.S. segment of the space station, uh, the official language, language is English. On the Russian segment of the space station, they speak Russian. When we visit each other's segments, we try to speak each other's language. But uh, I have to say that our Russian colleagues, their English is way better than my Russian. So we end up generally um, speaking English. But uh, it's a part of our training. All of the international partners, all of our Russian colleagues have to learn English and all of... Uh, the partners that live on the U.S. segment of the space station have to learn Russian uh, so that we can communicate. Hi, my name is Charlie, and I was wondering, how long do you have to train before you can go into space? Charlie, it's a long process. So when we first get selected into the astronaut office, we spend about two years training um, on all of the basics just to become an active astronaut. And so that is learning space station systems, how to do spacewalks, how to use the robotic arm, uh, flying in the T-38, our space flight readiness platform, and then also learning Russian. And after those two years, we graduate and become active astronauts. And once we get assigned to a mission, it's another year to year and a half of training um, for that mission specifically. And uh, um, it's, it's, an, it's an amazing experience. And, and uh, I think the best job on the Earth, uh, and of course, flying in space is the best job off the Earth. Hi, my name is Roger. And my question is, do you ever get dizzy or disoriented while floating? Well, um, that's a, it's an interesting question. Our, we have uh, sensory organs in our inner ear, vest vestibular apparatus. They sense accelerations and kind of tell your body if it's turning, if it's standing up or down. And so those can get a little confused when you get exposed to weightlessness because you don't have that constant acceleration of gravity on your body. There are some people that when they, right when they get into orbit, can it kind of feel like they're tumbling a little bit, but your inner ear will adapt to the situation. And so just kind of floating around and those sorts of things, you don't tend to get uh, dizzy. It is easy to become disoriented sometimes. We have racks that are just filled with stowage and sometimes we have to look for something at the back of the rack and we'll dive into there and, and turn around a little bit and when you come out of the rack it takes a minute or a few seconds to figure out which way is up and where you are uh, in the module and so that that sense of disorientation um, can occur while you're still up here uh, but in general you don't get dizzy up here unless you're spinning around or doing somersaults. Hello, my name is Brianna. My question is, does your body feel different after being in space for so long? Brianna, there are definitely some changes that you feel immediately upon arriving in low Earth orbit, and that is um, because the, the, there are physiologic changes that occur when you arrive in space. Gravity is no longer pulling down on the blood in your body and making it to pool in your legs and, and feet, and all that blood tends to shift up into the chest and head, and so you start to feel a little bit congested. You feel like your head is full. Some people have headaches. Um, but over time, your, your body adapts to that. And your body does an amazing job of adapting to this environment. You're not, you don't feel gravity. You don't have to uh, stand up against gravity or work against gravity. And so your bones don't feel those forces, and they start to uh, release um, minerals. And so in, your bones essentially weaken because you're not using them. It's the same with your muscles, your cardiovascular system. And so it's adapting to the space environment. We all want to go back to Earth, though. When we're done with our mission, we want to go back to Earth. And so those changes are not good for life on Earth. If we didn't do something about to those changes, once we got back to the Earth, we would be incredibly weak. Our hearts would not be able to, to keep up um, with just the, the mere action of standing up. We would pass out. And our bones would be very brittle and prone to, to breaking. And so we exercise every day for two hours to maintain our bone health, muscle strength, and cardiovascular uh, health. Uh, we have a treadmill, a, a exercise exercise uh, cycle, and then also essentially a weightlifting mach machine, kind of like a universal gym that, uh, that we use. Um, and, and the force is pro pro provided by uh, evacuated cylinders, and we can get up to 600 pounds of, of, uh, of force, and it does a great job of keeping us healthy. Hello, my name is Gracie, and my question is, what happens if you hurt yourself in space? Is there medical equipment in the space station? 
Gracie, great question. We do have a small medical kit, um, and we have at least two crew members who are trained as crew medical officers, essentially physician extenders uh, that will work on the instructions provided by the flight surgeon and mission control uh, to, to use the equipment and procedures that we have up here to deal with minor injuries and illness. Um, not every expedition has a doctor on it, uh, but uh, we've had a string of missions now. In the previous mission, Tom Marshburn was, is a, an emergency medicine doctor. That my, my background is actually in medicine. I'm an emergency medicine physician. And in just a, a week, we have our one of our replacement crew members, Frank Rubio, who's a family practice doctor, arriving. And so if there were an issue up here, um, we have some additional experience uh, that we could and skills that we could bring to bear if we needed to. But uh, we can only really treat mild or uh, injuries or illness. If there was a serious issue that developed, we would actually evacuate that individual, that crew member with their crew into, the via into their spacecraft and return them back to the earth for definitive treatment. Hello, my name is Caden. My question is, what has been the most interesting experience you've had in space? Caden, um, during my last mission seven years ago, we had uh, an experiment called Veggie, where we grew red romaine lettuce, um, and we actually got to eat it, which was really cool. Um, but those grew in, in essentially out of soil, little pillows of soil, uh, a soil matrix, and that's where the roots uh, dug in and got its nutrients and everything. Um, this time we have an experiment called X Roots, and it's kind of a next generation experiment where we're trying to grow plants, and right now we actually have lettuce, carrots, uh, onions, and radishes growing. And but we're using, we're not using soil, we're using aeroponics, uh, air delivered, aerosol delivered water, or hydroponics where the roots just sit in water. And uh, this has been really interesting. We've had some really uh, great results. And, and a lot of this work is just geared towards trying to find systems that are more scalable to the large types of installations we're gonna need once we do long duration exploration. What's really cool is thinking about having essentially kind of a greenhouse module uh, where we're growing plants not only for consumption to be a part of our food system, but something that can contribute to our environmental control system as well to scrub carbon dioxide out of the air and produce oxygen. And and I can just imagine that a greenhouse module like that would just smell great, and folks would love to be in there taking care of the plants. Hello, my name is Riley. My question is, has there ever been animals on the space station? Riley, we do have we have had animals in the space station. A long history of animals because the, their uh, shorter lifespans and rapid growth can help us understand a lot of the changes that happen uh, to a. a um, a living animal in this environment. Those changes happen more rapidly, and we can study them and understand uh, and predict some of the changes that are going to happen uh, to our astronauts, especially when we're thinking about long-duration spaceflight trips to uh, to the moon and to Mars. Um, one example is uh, the fruit fly. So the fruit fly is used in in, uh, in studies on the Earth and up here because it goes it goes very rapidly through very uh, different generations. We have a good under understanding of their genetic makeup, and we can see the changes that uh, occur over just a very short uh, period of time. Um, another animal that has been up here that uh, um, we don't have up here right now, but in the past um, they actually flew spiders just to see what what, how their web uh, weaving changed. And that was a very interesting exper experiment. And I'd encourage you to take a look online. I think you can see pictures of uh, the webs that were woven in uh, those experience experiments in the past. Hi, my name is Kai, and I was curious as to if music or sound in general sounds different in space or in the space station. Kai, that's an interesting question. Um, our space station is pressurized to the same atmospheric pressure that you would see at sea level, and and that has uh, that probably contributes the most to to the way sound travels. If uh, there were less pressure if we operated at a lower pressure and requiring a higher oxygen con content, but uh, at a lower pressure, we think that, that sound would not travel the same. Things would maybe um, sound a little bit different. But uh, in terms of just speech and those sorts of things, things sound very normal. Um, but the space station, 
definitely has a heartbeat. And so there are const there's constant ambient noise. For example, right now in the Japanese experiment module, I can hear the fans and the ventilation running. Those are all a critical part of circulating air to keep us healthy. Um, and so there's definitely background noise and uh, the sounds of kind of the space station, uh, space station being alive here, uh, and, and it's pretty cool. Hello, my name is Tristan, and I was curious as to whether or not you could simulate gravity on the spacecraft. Well, we don't have a method for um, simulating gravity for ourselves here on the International Space Station, but we do have experiments uh, when we want to uh, essentially maybe take a look at a plant, how a plant reacts to weightless disc grows and weightlessness and how it grows in a gravity environment. We can actually put, um, uh, we have experiments uh, where we can put the samples essentially on a centrifuge and spin them to create uh, essentially an artificial gravity. Um, like I said, we don't have that for, for the humans, but you can imagine that in the future for very long missions that we might consider uh, an artificial gravity system, essentially kind of a, fer a spinning Ferris wheel or the concept of the Taurus that you see in, in a movie like 2001 to simulate uh, gravity for, for the crew. Hello, my name is Nate. My question is, what has been the most interesting thing you've seen in space? Nate, uh, anytime we look out the window, we really have the opportunity to just see the, the majesty of the Earth uh, below. Uh, even if we're flying over the same area, the lighting, the weather, the seasons are all changing. And so getting to see that with our own eyes, um, getting to experience that is, is really kind of an emotional thing. Uh, one of my favorite things is seeing thunderstorms, uh, these flashes of light in clouds um, as we're flying overhead and, and knowing that you know there's a, a, a clap of thunder and, and, uh, and lightning that uh, is associated with each one of those. One of my personal favorite things uh, to see though is the aurora. Um, it is absolutely amazing, uh, these uh, just radiant arrays of, of green with uh, purple and red um, overtones and to see it in motion, uh, like a, just kind of snaking over the atmosphere, uh, it is absolutely amazing. Hello, my name's Luis. My question is, do you have to do anything different to help plants grow in space? Luis, that, that's it actually an, a, a, it's a really interesting question, and it really speaks to how amazing and magical the Earth is. To, to get plants to grow on the Earth, if you just accidentally drop a seed on the Earth, chances are pretty good um, that it's going to grow. And, and in fact, you have to weed gardens because, you know, grass or weeds or things just want to grow in the soil there. And to grow things up here, we have to be very intentional, very careful. We have to build enclosures specific um, to that to desire to want to grow things. We have to provide something for the roots to grow on, whether that's water or a soil matrix, like I talked about for um, veggie and X roots. Uh, we have to deliver water and nutrients so that we don't um, overwater the plants. We have to provide light. These are all things that happen naturally on the earth and in order to do it in space um, and, and to do it over long periods of time, we have to be very intentional about it. And, and, uh, and so, yes, uh, it can be challenging to grow things up here, but we've got, we're doing science uh, to do that to support our exploration in the future. My name is Robbie. My question for you is how do you get in how do you get in physical shape or get physical activity and while in space? Robbie, uh, physical activities and exercise is incredibly important for us up here. Um, the, the equivalent of what it's like to just uh, be in weightlessness is instead of being up here for six months, just lying flat in bed for six months. It has the same effect on the body. And you can imagine muscle atrophy, bone loss, um, cardiovascular deconditioning as a result of that. So like I said, we've got three major countermeasures, a cycle, an exercise cycle, a treadmill, and a weightlifting device called the ARED, the Advanced Resistive Exercise Device, um, where we can do squats and deadlift, uh, exercises to really strengthen our core, to load our bones, to stimulate um, that bone preservation and growth.
Uh, the treadmill is really interesting. We have to wear a harness. If we didn't wear a harness uh, on that first step, we would just fly up off of the, the treadmill. And so that harness holds us in place and gives us about 50 to 75% of our body weight. Uh, all three of these exercises do a great job of, job of keeping us um, uh, in shape uh, in preparation for our return to the earth. Hey, my name is Roxas, and my question is, how do you know which way is up in space? Alexis, that's a great question. And oftentimes people will say, hey, um, there is no up in space. It's whatever, uh, whatever position you desire uh, to be up or direction you desire to be up. And, and that can be true. For example, um, if I wanted to, if I needed to work on this wall, it might be more convenient for me to just put my feet over here and, uh, and work on, on one of the racks in here. And so up then is, you know, wherever my head is pointing. Uh, but for the most part, we do have directions up here. One of the major contributors to direction is the lighting. The lighting, we're very used to the lighting being ab above overhead, either the sun or the lights in our, in our homes and houses. And so the lighting is, gives us some um, sense of orientation and direction. Uh, the labels all tend to, and, and the switches and everything tend to be kind of so that uh, heads up is pointing away from the earth and our feet are down towards the earth. And then uh, finally, we train in simulators and mock-ups back on the ground. And so those definitely have an orientation. And so when, once we get up here, again, we're gonna be thinking back to the, the environment that we trained in, and that gives us a sense of direction as well. Hi, my name is Destiny, and my question is, what do you think the most important skill an astronaut should have? Well, there's so, there are so many things that I think are important to being able to live and work and get the, the mission done up here successfully. You have to be able to, to get along. You have to be a good teammate, um, looking out for others and allowing others to, to look after you. Uh, I think that um, one of the, the most important things, though, is adaptability, and that is uh, being able to be flexible, to adjust to the situation. Things don't always go as planned. Uh, we encounter obstacles and, and challenges, and being able to think outside the box and think, okay, this isn't going to work. Let's figure out how to do something a little bit different. Um, being able to do that as a team with our crew up here and also our, our team on the ground, um, that adaptability, uh, maintaining a positive attitude attitude on a, on a daily basis, uh, um, I think is really important to, to being successful, both in training and up here in orbit. Hello, my name is Danielle. My question is, how do you wash your hair with no gravity? I'm glad that you asked that, Danielle. So um, the gravity is not all that important. We don't have running water, so we end up basically taking uh, baths, towel baths, and we'll add uh, soapy water to a towel and scrub with that. This is our shampoo. This is a no-rinse shampoo, and so I'll just give you a quick demo. We just end up putting this on our hair. And then... Uh, you lather it up just like you do on the earth. Get an extra, getting an extra washing, hair washing today. And then you just, you don't, we don't rinse it. You just scrub it with the towel and voila, it's uh, your hair is washed. Hello, I'm Miranda Fritchman. I'm a member of Franklin County High School's science education team. On behalf of everyone here in Franklin County, I would like to extend our thanks to all of those involved in the NASA Downlink program. We are sure this experience is something our students will carry with them through graduation and beyond. Thank you very much. And thank you so much for the opportunity to chat with you and your students. Best wishes to the faculty, staff, the teachers, educators, mentors, um, to the parents and to the students. Uh, I encourage you all to, uh, to work hard and reach for the stars. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the event. Thank you to all participants. Station, we are now resuming operational audio communication.